2021. We're so happy that you are here with us. My name is Tiffany Kitchens and I am I'm on the board for DCTT. And I'd also like to welcome Franklin Coker who works with Project 10 Region 3. He is a fantastic asset to me in Polk County. Uh, we have a great presentation today for you for, from Lyman Dukes and Deborah Hart. They're going to discuss prepar preparing students with intellectual disabil disabilities and families for inclusive post-secondary education. Um, if you would, make sure that your microphones are muted. Uh, the session will be for 45 minutes. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll get to those for you. Um, and the session, if you should have any internet issues, these will be posted. All breakout sessions will be posted later on online. So if you have any questions or want to go back and listen to something, please feel free to do so. At this time, enjoy your um, enjoy the presentation. Have a great afternoon. Okay, is everyone able to see that? Do we have uh, the slide deck up? Is can can I just get some? Yes. Notes? Great. Yes. Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Wait, just another minute or two. It sounds like we still have some people joining. We we will get started very shortly. Everyone's having a a good afternoon, and that. Uh, Day one of the conference is going well so far. Just doing a little housekeeping there to make sure that the slide deck would move for me. One of my doc students that just showed up. That's good to see. He's he's in the right place. All right. I think we will go ahead and start. Um, I want to honor. Uh, so many of you that have, that have shown up uh, promptly at 345. Um, first of all, um, it's really exciting to see such a, such a large group joining us today. So um, first of all, thank you for that. Um, I, just out of an abundance of caution, I'm gonna, I've already been kicked off Zoom once today and I'm just fearful that it may happen again. So to try to reduce bandwidth and given that we're focused on the slide deck, I'm gonna, turn my video off just for a little bit while I chat. But again, focus upon the slide deck. That's really where, um, where our attention needs to be right now. All right, so uh, thank you again for joining our session today. We're excited to have a chance to uh, share with you an ongoing Florida-based project uh, that we believe has national implications as well. Um, my name is Lyman Dukes. And I'm a faculty member in special education at the University of South Florida. Uh, I'm also the co-principal investigator, uh, along with Danny Roberts Don, who I suspect um, some of you may know, uh, of the newly funded UMatter program for students with intellectual disability at University of South Florida's St. Petersburg campus. Uh, we anticipate enrolling uh, our first students in August of this year. Uh, I have the pleasure of working along with Deb Hart from Think College, who is the co-principal investigator of the project um, we'll share with you today. Actually, I, I take that back. Deb may be the, the sole PI. Um, Deb, if you would take a moment and introduce yourself to the group. Sure, thanks, Lyman. Hi, everyone. Boy, I'm blown away at the number of attendees at this on virtual Zoom room. And uh, so really, thank you all for coming. Um, I work at the Institute for Community Inclusion at UMass Boston and um, Think College, the National Coordinating Center for students with intellectual disabilities going to college is the primary or premier project that I work on there. Simon, back to you. Yeah. Hi, hi, Lyman and Deb. This and I just wanted to share with you as you begin that
that what we're seeing are your slide and your notes. So if you if you desire to only show your slide without your notes, just make sure to put it either in presentation presentation mode that's, or slide. Yeah, that's really interesting because all I can see, I have it in presentation mode. So I, I'm really confused by that. Thank you for pointing that out. I just stopped sharing and I'm gonna try again. That's interesting, Moiman. I could see the presentation notes. That's perfect. What you just did is, I think we just see the slide now. Okay. So, so we're in good shape now. Yes. I, I do appreciate you pointing that out. Um, I was seeing something different, so I'm, gl I'm glad we resolved that. Okay. So uh, this uh, second slide here gives you a, a big picture view of our session content. Um, First, we'll, we'll provide a national impression for what opportunities exist for students with ID. Uh, and we'll also share the goals of the current project. Uh, following explanation of the research methods, next we'll share the barriers and solutions that were generated as a function of the study. And then we'll conclude the session with an opportunity to discuss both the study and uh, this topic overall. Um, Ask questions along the way. It, it may be easiest to type those into the chat uh, during the session. I'm, I'm hoping that our, I'm hoping that Franklin may, may be monitoring that for us. And then, of course, we can um, chat amongst the entire group um, at the end of the session or at the end of the slide deck. All right. I think I've got this working now. So, as promised, uh, some background information. Prior to the study explanation, um, as some of you may know, Think College is a national organization uh, dedicated to developing, expanding, uh, and improving inclusive hiring options for people with ID. Uh, the center engages in quite a few activities that focus really upon a few major goals. Um, first, uh, they engage in generating and sharing knowledge, really with a focus on uh, moving research to practice. Uh, secondly, they focus upon uh, guiding institutional change. So uh, as example, they've developed standards, quality indicators, uh, and benchmarks as a guide for the field. Uh, third, they work to inform public policy. Uh, that is, uh, they work to help stakeholders to align uh, policy with current initiatives uh, and their practice. Uh, and then fourth, um, they engage directly with students, professionals, and families as well. Uh, so that is the organization uh, works to directly inform what they perceive to be their most important stakeholders uh, to keep them engaged and involved. And of course, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't mention again that Deb is the co-PI of Fink College. This darn thing is, doesn't, there we go. All right. Um, as we can see quite clearly in this graph, uh, college programs for students with ID have increased dramatically in the past 15 years. Um, and interestingly, if we look um, at the years 2019 to 2020, um, that appears to be an especially good year for program development. Um, and what's not actually communicated uh, in the slide is that this increase is due to the latest funding uh, for TIPSIDS that was announced several months back uh, and resulted in, I think, 22 new programs being funded throughout the US. Um, we certainly applaud the significant uptick in the number of programs nationwide. And Deb, please feel free to correct me if 22 is not the correct number. No, no, you're spot on. Okay, I, I just would tell people the Higher Education Opportunities Act of 2008 went into full implementation 2009, uh, 2010. And that's where if you look at this line um, graph, you'll see that, that 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 act really, really had such a significant impact on the number of um, institutes of higher education that are supporting students with intellectual disabilities and in going to college. Great, thanks for that, Deb. All right, so this slide depicts the program options by state uh, with 49 of the 50 states all having at least uh, one program. Um, New York, Massachusetts, California, and Florida 
currently have the largest number of programs, as you can see here. And as you may know, you know, we in Florida are fortunate to have a, a state funding stream for the development and support of programs for students with ID. Um, and of course, it's our hope we'll see more initiatives of this type in other states. Um, specific information on programs by state can be found at the bottom, I believe it's at the bottom of the Think College landing page, uh, whose web address is noted here and is thinkcollege.net. All right, so this is rather interesting. Um, what we have here, the number of higher ed institutions in existence in the US, so we see that it's uh, a bit north of 4,600 currently. And here, um, this slide represents the percentage of those uh, 4,600 or so higher ed institutions currently serving students with ID. So, you know, as we can see, and what we're really trying to highlight is that there's quite a bit of room for significant growth um, as far as college is concerned for this student group. So now on to the current study. Um, in 2018, uh, Deb was awarded funding through the Florida Developmental Disabilities Council to examine barriers, practices, and policies uh, that may inhibit program development and delivery. Um, specifically, the council wanted to highlight barriers and then subsequently posit solutions to the barriers that were identified with the overall goal of increasing the number of colleges, universities, um, and career technical ed programs uh, that serve students with IDD throughout Florida. So we'd like to first um, highlight that Florida is a national leader in the development and delivery of programming for college students with ID. Uh, in fact, I, I suspect, as, as many of the attendees know, uh, the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities provides funding not only for program development and delivery, uh, but also offers students scholarship funding for program participation. And, and certainly the value of the center um, and its work uh, has and will continue to have a very a meaningful impact upon adult life opportunities for students with ID in our state. Um, that said, even with these investments in infrastructure and opportunity, uh, colleges and universities and career tech ed institutions do continue to experience challenges implementing programs for the population. Uh, and in response, as mentioned a moment ago, uh, the DD Council has spearheaded an effort to articulate the barriers and then work on identifying solutions uh, to the barriers that are identified uh, through the study process. Okay, I did not think that I skipped one. So, so we began the process of barrier identification by ensuring that we understood what the definitions of higher ed are in Florida. Um, so we needed to know how the terms were defined. So. Uh, the Florida State University system comprises the 12 public universities that we have in the state. The Florida college system actually includes uh, 28 community and state colleges, uh, while the technical colleges are organized into career clusters um, and then geared towards students in the Florida secondary ed and Florida college system. So we were interested in learning about or, or learning about and from institutions uh, that do not have programs, but may have considered or had actually pursued hosting a program at one point. We also wanted to hear from IHEs that are in the process of establishing programs, as well as those currently providing programs to uh, students with ID or IDD. So we developed a, or put together initially a project advisory committee, and it was charged really with guiding um, all of the project activities given their expertise with respect to um, serving this population in the state of Florida. And the membership represented, it, represented an array of relevant programs and agencies across the state. So in terms of data gathering, um, we began by holding focus groups. Uh, the groups were divided into the groups I mentioned just a moment ago uh, and did include representation from the IHEs uh, as well as relevant agencies such as, v, such as VR. Um, that data resulted in the identification uh, of some emerging themes, and I'll share that in just a moment. 
We also gathered information through three online surveys, uh, again, with the same participant groups. Uh, the surveys were sent to approximately 120 IHEs and ultimately resulted in about a 30% response rate. And then last, we finished by conducting uh, some key informant interviews uh, with IHE members that didn't have programs, really with the goal of gathering additional evidence and just going a little further in depth about the topic that maybe um, we didn't feel like we'd gather through the survey process. So this map actually provides a really nice visual depiction of the programs offered actually in the 2018, 2019 year. So it's changed slightly since then, but we're utilizing this one because um, these are the programs that existed when the study uh, was completed. So as you can see, there are a number of different types of programs in the state. Uh, the star represents programs that have status as an approved Florida program, as well as being a federally approved comprehensive program. Uh, the red dot indicates a program is approved as a Florida post-secondary comprehensive program, but not yet approved uh, on the federal level. Uh, yellow dots are those institutions that offer programs for students with ID, uh, but as of 2018, 2019, hadn't been appro approved in Florida or at the federal level. And then last, uh, the blue dot represents those programs that are designed to support students with autism uh, in post-secondary settings. So this slide presents a portion of the survey data analysis. Um, what we shared here are the 10 most often noted barriers to program development. Um, as you can see here, uh, the 10 noted uh, were all shared rather often, spanning from about two thirds of respondents noting transportation as a barrier to four in 10 respondents indicating limited support from institutional leadership um, and limited credentialing options as barriers. Um, certainly at least one takeaway here, I think, is that many teams are interested, uh, that are interested in program development seem to often encounter similar challenges. Um, I will mention that while transportation was the most commonly noted barrier, um, the project advisory committee uh, advises to focus uh, in the second year of this project on um, some other matters, and, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a moment. So I mentioned the emergent themes a moment ago. Um, these are the themes identified as part of the qualitative component of the project, uh, the focus group sessions and the key informant interviews uh, that were follow up um, with five of the survey respondents resulted in three themes. Uh, theme one revolved around navigating IHE, IHE systems that don't effectively support programming for students with IDD. And those noted included issues such as having a difficult time finding campus allies, uh, as well as encountering issues um, with a lack of relevant campus policies and procedures. Um, I don't think that those, uh, those, those issues are, are, are especially surprising, but they're important to know. Um, theme two focused upon challenges impacting student success. And examples uh, here that were reported by participants included challenges such as students being unprepared for college, and then perhaps not surprisingly, um, noting a need for improved transition relevant preparation at the secondary level. Uh, they also indicated on the college side that there were limited course options for students with IDD. Uh, theme three uh, was the challenge of sustaining programs for students with IDD in college settings. And, and here participants uh, shared they encountered barriers such as securing ongoing funding for programs, uh, and also shared that courses in which students had interest uh, weren't always aligned with the student's VR plan for employment. Uh, the Think College Standards, Quality Indicators, and Benchmarks uh, were utilized as a guide uh, when preparing the strategic plan uh, that spells out possible solutions uh, to the barriers identified. Um, in fact, the standards were developed to guide new program development and, and to actually enhance the quality of existing programs as well. So uh, using the, the standards in this manner aligns the strategic plan 
uh, we believe with the most uh, current body of knowledge on higher ed for students with IDD. Um, it's also important to mention that the standards are composed of evidence-based practices and policies um, for quality higher ed initiatives for students um, with ID. And also they align with the requirements of the Higher Ed Opportunity Act of 2008. And, and Deb, have the new standards, have they been published? I, I no, say we're, okay. we're just completing the update of these um, standards and um, quality indicators and benchmark and the new uh, updated document will have in it um, examples of what a particular practice or quality indicator looks like um, or illustrative pra um, practices and what evidence you would need to demonstrate that, yes, in fact, you are doing this. Okay, so great. I, I think That's, it's gonna be a nice addition. Fantastic. So I'm gonna hand it off to you if that is okay. And I will be your, your Vanna here and, and do my best to move the slides forward at the appropriate time. Thank you, Lyman. Again, on the, the update of the um, standards, quality indicators and benchmarks, I'm thinking they're on thinkcollege.net, N-E-T. The update will be available, I'm hoping, in, in probably up two to three months. Okay, so Lyman identified what some of the um, emerging barriers were that we identified through um, the study that we did. And what I'm gonna talk about is some of those barriers and some of the solutions that we currently know are possibilities, just as examples. In almost all of the information I'm going to present, and I'll repeat this again, uh, is available on the thinkcollege.net NET website. Um, the first one was lack of institutional support. And I think that's one of the major ones because that's the issue is, first of all, lots of institutes of higher education even aren't aware, are unaware that this, that students with intellectual and developmental disabilities are, it's an option for them to go to college. Secondly, many are resistant or don't know how to go about it. And at the University of Central Florida, uh, folks used an eight step change model that I think was pretty powerful. Um, I, it's done by um, Cotter and it, it really focuses on institutional and systems change. Now, what I tell people is that you don't necessarily have to follow all eight steps, but the idea is to have guiding entities, whether it's a leadership team within, composed of uh, folks within the college, um, from the president to, or chancellor to the provost to, you know, uh, people, direct line folks who are um, heading disability services, for example, and faculty. And uh, this insight brief describes the process in detail and is really um, what we've seen is some very strong programs start by using some of the features of this eight step model uh, it, in creating some of the college based leadership, creating ownership of the program in really looking at um, enhanced communication and um, hopefully creating uh, practices that speak to sustainability. Instead of you know, linking all the elements of the program to what already exists, that's there already, whether it's the mission statement, whether it's disability service registration and so forth. So I, I think it's a nice, um, model to consider using and, and or modifying. 
The other, which is part of the model, is looking at a college-based advisory entity for ensuring that ongoing communication. So the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. And um, with an eye to sustainability from the very, very, very beginning, again, linking all the elements in the model to existing services and supports within the host Institute of Higher Education. Uh, next slide, please. The next barrier was looking at course access and then credential options. And some of what you see um, here is on, on course access is, again, I'm going back to the alignment with existing structures and um, services and resources. The first step really, and this is within the Higher Education Opportunities Act, requires some type of person-centered planning be facilitated with the student, if possible, taking the lead to identify what their career goals are and um, working with an existing advisory entity at the college or university to identify courses and other personal areas of interest, but most importantly, courses that link to this career goal. Most like going to college for any um, folks, it's the, the main goal is about getting employment and not, not just entry level employment, but more um, career rather than just, you know, one-time job. And, um, really beginning to work with faculty and empowering the student to work with faculty on what type of accommodations and, and disability services, an existing entity in, they may be called something other than disability services, but it's important that they, students be supported to work with the disability services at every college or university has to have one. Um, and obviously some are better than others, but uh, students need to learn how to work with those folks to address a, uh, request accommodations and to do so with faculty as well. Um, credential options are, it's been really interesting over the last 10 years to see how this area has evolved. When we first started, people were creating a credential that was made on their laptops. That's not what I'm talking about. That would be something not to do. <laughs> we're looking at, the first step is really looking at um, uh, what are the existing credentials? The majority of students are not degree seeking in these or matriculating in these programs, but they are seeking a meaningful credential uh, which can take the form of an existing certificate or a uh, newly developed certificate that is um, non-degree. And uh, if you look at the resources on this page, what you'll see, and in addition to, I think it was six um, standalone briefs that the consortium on inclusive post-secondary education uh, developed at the University of um, Central Florida. And that's still on their website. And it's all, these are all available on um, thinkcollege.net. And I, I would highly recommend looking at those six standalone briefs. They really um, break it out individually on things to focus on. Plus there are national uh, resources which are included in the publication on the non-degree non credentials um, of value. So I, I think there are resources now uh, that where when we first started, none of these materials existed. So it's, it's interesting to, to see. 
Um, one I would highly recommend looking at is an existing credential that's offered by, by Virginia Commonwealth University through their ACID and college program. It was an existing credential, and I think that's the place to start. Um, is looking to see if there's anything already on the books at your Institute of Higher Ed. The next step is creating one or looking if, to see if there's a national uh, credential available and getting that through um, the um, infrastructure, approved through the uh, infrastructure of the host Institute of Higher Ed. Next slide, please. Another um, area that was um, identified as a barrier was programmatically for uh, faculty preparation. Now that can take the, the uh, role of training future or current uh, faculty or instructors, or it can be those who are already practicing. And the key areas we look at are um, in the teacher training programs is those increasing the number of options um, around transition or college-based transition programs. Many, many, many um, teacher training institutes of higher ed aren't even training that this is an option for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities and what it all entails and what students need to be better prepared for that. Uh, the other is looking at um, universal design for learning features that assist faculty in really um, enhancing their courses for any student, not just students with intellectual or developmental disability. And it's important to look at multiple means of uh, presentation of material, of uh, how to will multiple means of, um, for, so the student can demonstrate uh, competency in, in the, or the course content. And I, I think it's those type of features are important. And um, they also provide faculty with more confidence to um, address the needs of, of a wide, much right, a wider array of students, including those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Next slide, you were right to do that. So Deb, Deb just as a point of, of point of information, we've got a little less than 15 minutes left, just so you know. Okay, I've talked about um, support. Thank you, Simon. I'll, I'll speed it up. I won't go into the details as much. Um, student support at college. That one of the key things is there's every college or university has disability services. So it would be supporting the student to um, connect with those um, services and supports, and maybe coming up with a. Um, between the program that the student is in and the disability service uh, memorandum of understanding who's going to deliver what. So there's coordination. And, um, and it's going to vary from campus to campus. But again, um, those services are there. Next slide, please. Students' pr preparation for college and high school was the next barrier because um, students were coming from high school, like for, especially for college-based transition programs. But even if they went from exited high school into a college program that was supporting students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they weren't prepared. Now, the Florida Center for Students with Unique abilities has um, transition clubs that are inclusive for all students in that particular high school and their funding uh, activity, pr primarily a lot that goes to food to support those um, clubs. Project 10 certainly has lots of information on their website. And I would highly recommend also 
Um, in the uh, transition book, Navigating the Transition from High School to College, there's a chapter in there around foundational skills for college and career success. Those are important skills that students should learn before they get to college. More often than not, whether you have a disability or not, you're not learning those skills. Those are soft skills, executive functioning, um, how to manage your schedule and you know, get to your class on time with your homework done. I certainly could have used that when I went to college, but anyway. Next slide, please. Okay, family prep preparation and engagement in inclusive post-secondary ed. There's a major need for awareness that families need to know that this is a possibility. And the thinkcollege.net website has information specific for families. And there's a closed group, Facebook group, um, that is incredibly active. And it's just for families. We only made the space available. So if you know any families, you can get the link on uh, thinkcollege.net. And I, I would hope you would make families aware of that. It's a great resource and, and, and support to one another. Next slide, please. Interagency collaboration is a major one and the main, main, main um, agency is vocational rehabilitation with a lot of the pre ets programs. Um, also, if you see the picture of the gentleman with the big beard, uh, he's uh, he used to be the um, VR director in um, Utah at one time, and he's he's our expert content expert in VR and is available to provide technical assistance to folks if if you request that information. But there's a lot happening with um, pre-ets and voc rehab. Next slide, please. This speaks to interagency collaboration and more to sustainability. I just wanna highlight um, the, um, if you look at the insight briefs, a lot of that's around Medicaid waivers and how different states are using Medicaid waivers to sustain programs and to start them where students are using their waiver to uh, pay for services and supports uh, the other is partner, Partnership Plus that is offered through Voc Rehab. It's a grossly underutilized entity. And the other piece is as part of the Higher Ed Op Opportunities Act, and certainly within um, Florida at the Florida Center, uh, Lyman mentioned the um, scholarship funds. Uh, becoming a comprehensive transition program means you're program that you offer for students um, means they can apply for federal financial aid. The, the requirements for regular financial aid are waived, uh, not student loans, only like work study uh, type of uh, federal aid. Next slide, please. Uh, you know what, I mean, you talked about these, let's, in, in, Hoping for, um, I'm just going to say we've developed some online modules, which the Florida Center will be hosting. So stay tuned. Those are coming soon on better preparation in, in high school and what type of supports are available when you go to college. Next slide, please. This talks about those modules. Next slide, please. Uh, it also mentions our five-part speaker series. Oh, that's right. Uh, I think we have one more session coming up. If you look at the at the electronic flyer here on the right side of the page, and you see May twenty fourth. Um, if you are interested in that topic, and we certainly hope you are, um, please do feel free to join us. That particular topic is on non um, non academic supports for students and. Kelly Kelly from the University of Western Carolina will be presenting it. Thanks, Lyman, for catching that. You bet. So now that we're at the end of the slide deck, I'm gonna I'm gonna reappear.
Um, I, I mentioned to the facilitators that I was on a call earlier today, actually with a potential book publisher in, from London, and I got kicked off Zoom for about five minutes. It was not good timing. So anyway, I'm back. We, we, we'd love to entertain some questions if, if the group um, would like to do that. Well, this is a first. Usually we get lots of questions. I have a question. Um, this is Jamie Jocelyn from um, Pinellas County Schools. Hi, Jamie. And, hi, how are you? Great. Good. So um, a lot of great information. And one of the things that um, I would like to know, working for a school district, how can we, what more can we do to communicate opportunities like this to our families? If you go to the thinkcollege.net, there's a lot of information in the four families section. Additionally, uh, I would encourage you to link them to the family support group, the f closed Facebook group, because the, the, uh, I've never seen quite an active group. It, it ebbs and flows, but more active than not. Um, and if you don't find what you're looking for, um, Lyman, can you go to the last slide? Sorry. Do, do you mean here, Deb? Yes, please. You see thinkcollegeta at gmail.com? Yes. We will help you directly. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. Somebody has asked to see the slide for the May event. Which was where Lyman was going when I asked him to go back to the... Lyman, is there a way you can blow that up a little bit? I, I will certainly try. Um, let's see. I don't know that making it any. And. Um, or, or if you guys are able to put the link in the chat. Yeah, I think that may be the, the most sensible thing to do. Let me see if I can track that down while somebody asks another question. And I will, um, I'll send that to the group. Other questions? We've got about four minutes, so we we'd love to to use that time um, effectively and efficiently. Um, could you speak to the high school clubs that they have? They offer um, with unique abilities and what that looks like. Well, there's a wide range. I, I and I have not had the opportunity, COVID, uh, it, to visit or really get much more information. But we will be having a fact sheet available on those clubs because they're, they're showing really good outcomes in terms of um, knowledge, translation, you know, public education for both students and families. And this is all students. It's not just students with intellectual or developmental disability. Okay, Lyman, do you want to take this question? Uh, I've been hunting for a uh -huh. flyer, so I'm, I'm sorry I missed the question. This is that. around what is available to students on the autism spectrum for matriculating students degree seeking. Um, yeah. Who went, who was wanted to use his current IEP as documentation and he was told he needed to obtain um, well, that's, a more yeah, recent. That is interesting. So 
Yeah, I can speak to that. So some colleges and universities have, be have begun um, doing things like accepting just the IEP um, as evidence. Um, however, they're not required to do so. So um, there is still the legal expectation and many institutions still still subscribe to that, um, that the individual would also provide um, a diagnostic evaluation. Historically, that's been one that's uh, no more than say three to five years old, but some colleges and universities have begun to waive that expectation as well, and they're accepting um, older documentation. Uh, so they are sort of within their right to um, expect something above and beyond an IEP. And, and really the rationale is to um, try to, you know, gather enough information to provide reasonable and appropriate accommodations to the student. Does that, does, does that sort of get at that question? I hope that it does. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. I was, uh, she had called me and I was rethinking myself as she was telling me these things. And I wasn't entirely sure if it was a college to college thing or if it was just universal now. It so is going you. to be different given whomever is, is uh, the person who's directing that office. Um, yeah. It used to be quite a bit more universal than it is now, but it's, it's not quite as universal anymore. Thank also, you. you might want to check out the Association of Higher Education and Disability AHEAD website has information on that. That's a, okay. thank you for mentioning that, Deb, AHEAD.org. Um, just, just as a sort of a last point, because I know we're, we're, we're at 430 here, I will track down the, the flyer and I will make sure that um, that gets out um, really to everyone in attendance. I'm at the conference. So I'll connect with the conference organizers and, and make sure that that flyer is accessible to everyone. So I think we're at a point where we can um, thank the group again. And, and I did see in the chat just now that slide notes were showing. I'm so sorry about that. I, I tried twice and it seemed like it was working appropriately at one time. And somehow shifted back on its own. I cannot see the notes on my end. All I see are the slides. So that's, that's why I didn't know and I apologize for that. So thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you all. Make sure if you have questions, think college TA at Gmail. <laughs>